so good morning everyone. My name is Patricia Lobacaro and I'm the pres president and CEO of Brazil Foundation, an organization that exists here in New York in Brazil for 17 years. And we are uh, a philanthropic bridge between people who want to invest in projects in Brazil and good initiatives transforming communities in the whole country. So today I was asked by Mr. Roberto de Azevedo to open this panel. Brazil Foundation is a member of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce for more than a decade. So I'm very honored to be here presenting this panel who is going to talk about the intersection about philanthropy and social innovation. So Brazil Foundation, every year we open a call for proposals and we receive uh, project proposals applying for funding from all over Brazil. We receive more than a thousand proposals per year. And in the year 2013, we received an application for a project from a small town in Sergipe called Santa Luisa de Tain. And it was a project trying to develop a coding program with children and adolescents in small fishermen community in a rural area in Sergipe. And then we thought, oh, coding, like computer coding? And yes. So some people would look at this project and ask, why? But then we asked, why not? And uh, I didn't meet Saulo until 2014. Then I went to this conference called uh, GIFI. GIFI is the Grupo of Institutos, Fundações e Empresas. In Brazil, they have the biggest philanthropic conference in Sao Paulo every two years. So in 2014, I went to the Congress. And I saw a panel on innovation and education. And this guy, Saulo, was on the panel. And he said, I have a dream to transform Santa Luzia do Itaim in the most creative city of Brazil by 2020. And I said, wow, this is about vision, dreams. And today, Brazil needs a lot of that. So. During these four years, I have had the opportunity to witness what he's doing in the city. I went personally there in 2016 um, to see what they were doing. And much beyond the coding uh, project we funded, they do a lot more than that. They are an incubator of social technologies. And I'm not going to explain all of them, because that's Saulo's role. So without much further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce the panelists, but uh, from Brazil Foundation's perspective, this is the one of the most successful projects we've ever funded in education, technology, creativity. You know, here in the US, we call STEAM, and uh, this is one of the best projects we've ever funded in this area. So I have the honor to introduce Mr. Saldo Barreto, co-founder of IPTI, Institute of Research in Technology and Innovation. Saul is an engineer with a PhD in Structural Analysis of Complex Problems and co-founder of the Institute of Research in Technology and Innovation, where he's responsible for institutional relations and new businesses. Since 2009, he has coordinated the consolidation process of IPTI as an international reference center in social technologies. IPTI is located in southern Sergipe, in Santa Luisa de Itaim, one of the poorest municipalities in Brazil, a city he believes will be the most creative in the world by 2025. He upgraded no, for the most uh, creative city in the world. So, <laughs> so it's not just Brazil anymore, so it's 2025. And I would like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Lau, founding partner of Predictively Consulting. Mr. Lau is founding partner of Predictive Consulting, a company which measures the financial impact of brand, innovation, human capital, and other intangible assets. Is co-author of Invisible Advantage, in addition to two other books and numerous articles. He has worked with organizations such as Pfizer, General Motors, Petrobras, Major League Baseball, Southwest Air, UPS, United Technologies, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Federal Reserve Bank, the European Commission, and the Chinese Ministry of Technology. Mr. Lowe serves as Deputy Assistant Secretary 
for Work and Technology Policy at the U.S. Department of Labor. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College and Yale University School of Management. So, um, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Thank you for the Chamber of Commerce for hosting us. And Salo, it's a pleasure to listen to you once again about the developments of your project. So thank you very much for you to be here with us, my friend John Lau, who is one of maybe one of the only the one American who put his feet on Santa Luzia de Itaim <laughs> up to now. <laughs> we have only one passport in Santa Luzia, who belongs to Matheus, who came here last year in our event, but he is improving. So Santa Luzia has really changed to become the most creative city in the world in 2025. Uh, I'd like to start to say about innovation because our discussion here is how we improve, so how you bring innovation to our social investments. How this crucial issue is now, if you really want to change the world in a positive sense, of course. So when I decided to move, so I, I, I'm from Aracaju, the capital city of Sergipe. I did civil engineer. I moved to São Paulo, to São Carlos, to make a master in structural analysis and then a PhD, so that I, I went to Germany, I came back, I became a professor, I came to Columbia University for a post-PhD, and then I, became prof I came back to work as a professor, and then I created a PTI because I lost my patience with the bureaucracy of the universities. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to live until 150, 160 years old, <laughs> but uh, I don't have time enough to lose my patience in my time with bureaucracy. That's why we quit and created IPTI in Sao Paulo. And then in 2009, we took the decision to move IPTI from Sao Paulo to one of the poorest cities in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has 5,570 cities. Santa Luzia holds the, the position of 5,268 in the Human Development Index. So then you can imagine this is very poor. But Santa Luzia represents somehow the reality that we face in Latin America and Africa. So you have to dream, dream big. So we really believe that Santa Luzia has the competence and the capacity to build solutions that can be, can be spread in Latin America and Africa in the future. That's why I really believe on that. But it's funny because when I decided to take the decision, all people, including my mother, said, you are crazy. <laughs> so now some people, not yet my mother, they say, you are a visionary. I mean, visionary is just a crazy person with reputation. <laughs> so we really need to think crazy if you really want to change and make impact. The question, we are still very conservative and we are losing normal time and, and energy and money to try to make the same expecting different results. And that's why, that's why innovation is so crucial if you really think about social impact. And what I'm going to do here is to talk a little bit about our history to explain to you how we really believe that innovation is so important. And it's funny because when I come to a company, I'm going to talk with someone from corporate re social responsibility, I like to say that, okay, thank you very much for receiving me, but I came here to offer you the opposite you want. So usually the companies want to put as less money as possible to achieve the maximum number of beneficiary and no risk. So I came here to ask you a lot of money. We are going to benefit very, very small number of beneficiary and there is a high risk. But if it works, we assure you effectiveness, scalability and sustainability. So this is the same talk we are going to have if you want to develop things like that. So if you develop a new mobile, you have to put a lot of money on research and innovation. You are going to produce very few pilots to see maybe it's going to work or not. There is a high risk. But you know in your business, this is the only way you, you remain competitive in the market. Why don't bring this perspective and vision to social investment? So. Let me see. Because private sector, when they are try, when they, they put money on, on social projects, I know people have in mind, they expect effectiveness and scalability. This is the common speech now. But they try to do in the traditional way. I mean, they want something for the 21st century, but to work in the 19th century in perspective in terms of investment. Because it is very important to take in time, taking my that the people you want to help, they have a different mindset. 
I have a friend who helps rich people to invest socially. And she came once to me and said, Saulo, people want, they don't want really to help. They want to tell people how they should do. Because we have the, I would say, not intentional tendency to expect people to react in their own logic. But we are talking about people that if they have the same logic that you have, they would not be poor, probably. They would be entrepreneur or rich or different. So we have to think that this is the mindset the, the community you are talking about. Are people with uh, strong welfare? I mean, they are dependent on welfare. In Brazil, the city where I work, 70% of the families receive Bolsa Familia. So they were slaves in the, in the past, they were colonialismo, I don't know how to translate in English, but they have a long period of dependence, and now they are social assistance dependence. The second is short-term thinking. This is Brazilian, this is not just Santa Luzia. We have in Brazil a short-term thinking, low self-esteem. This is our, unfortunately, our soul. And lately, lately we have the lack of trust. Uh, uh, trust is maybe the most crucial issue in terms of low development Brazil. So that's, that makes high cost and that makes no innovation possible. We have a very hostile environment to produce innovation technology in Brazil because you have a trust problem. So we are not talking here, if you really want to impact, if you really want to change, we are not talking about technology itself. We are talking about change mindset. And this takes time. It's not something that we can change very quickly. So every problem we need to solve is a complex problem. So I'm very lucky that I did civil engineer in, in PhD on structural analysis because I work with complex problems, okay, engineer problems. But I, I cannot remember how to do the, the accounting, so the, the formula, but I remember that you cannot solve a complex problem by using linear equations. <laughs> so we need to use complex solutions. <laughs> and that comes the problem when you put money, public or private, in social issues. We are always expecting to find a linear perspective of solving the situation. Then you always waste your money, your time, and mainly the main asset is hope. We cannot lose hope because we have lack of hope and love in Brazil and other countries to make, an, again, a mistake on that. And I found in South Africa a very nice de definition how to solve a complex problem. There are only two mechanisms, two approaches. One's the practical one, the second is the miraculous one. <laughs> the practical one is the most common in Brazil and mainly in Santa Luzia. How it works, everyone isolated, you start to pray to a saint or an angel to come and solve the problem. <laughs> that was happening all the time. Um, a saint can be the mayor, God, or a, a deputy, something like that. The miraculous, this is the most difficult, is when all the people involved in the problem give their hands and start to work together to solve the problem. So, we have an agnostic and like institution, but we believe in miracles. And our miracles are called social technologies, and in social technologies, social technology is an effective solution, a scalable solution, so it has to be effective, has to be scalable. It, to be this, to achieve this, this level of quality, community is crucial. So, a community is not my beneficiary. Community is part of my research team. And that's why I quit the university, because I was not capable to make this. I, I like to say that when you do PhD, we develop a non-intentional arrogance to think that we are very good. <laughs> we are good, of course, we are very good, but not good enough. Because, come back to what I said before, we are talking about change mindset. So that means you are giving for people things that they do not want, maybe. They do not know they want. They need, but they do not know yet. So, you must have a kind of capacity of mediation convincing people how they should change. You know that. But the way they should change is not your perspective. It has to be their perspective. So then you must make a huge effort. No publications, because we fail a lot. And Nature and Science magazine doesn't publish fail. They just publish success. So in terms of the science and technology finance system, this is completely wrong, because you are going to spend a lot of time, no publishing, etc. But this is the only way you can really make impact. So, 
because community we are talking about, they have low self-esteem. They do not trust that they are capable to produce knowledge. And that's very complicated to deal with. So I talk about the, the two issues. So efficacy and scalability are the main pillars of a social technology. And to build this, community has to be co-researcher. And co-researcher is much more, so there is a word that I really hate. Sorry if you, someone like here, is this design thinking. It means that the world exists before design thinking and after design thinking. Look. <laughs> Uh, design, if you put a table with five, five people from here and five people from a community, it doesn't build the design thinking process. Because it really requires a great energy to move forward to the people to understand their dynamics in order to build something really sustainable and effective. So, and to give an example, I, I, I bring here for this, this, this panel two examples in education. One example is uh, how can we try to improve quality in public education, which is one of our mission. And a second mission is how can we produce effective education for entrepreneurship. Because if you are, re you see, if you are working in a community which is far away from big cities and very poor, if you do not create local qualified work opportunities, the young people need to move to big cities, and we have problems in northern Brazil with these crowd cities like Rio, Salvador, and Sao Paulo. So, Chiara is a teacher of a public school in Santa Rosa de She teaches in the village of Campo Nossa Senhora, it's a small village, and she teaches what we call multiseriada classroom. Multiseriada means that you have students for the first, second, and third grade in the same classroom because there is no habitants enough to create these specific classrooms. And as a bonus, she has two children, two students with mental disability. Mm. So, and she is alone. And the whole society think Chiara is the guilty for the failure of the public education. <laughs> That's the, 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 the common sense. We think that the teachers, they are very, all the time we will listen in the high society that the teachers of public schools, they are very bad. They don't care about education. It's the opposite. They are claiming for help. So, with Chiara, we started in 2010 to develop Synapse Social Technology. Synapse is a combination between neuroscience knowledge about cognitive learning process. So we have a partnership with a team that works since 20 years about this issue. But a combination with Chiara. When I talk about Chiara, I'm talking about a, a set of teachers that help us. So the knowledge of Chiara how it works in a real public schools, a school that this neuroscience never put his feet, is crucial. It's so crucial as the neuroscience knowledge. But she doesn't know that. She thinks that because we are neuroscientists, so she, we must know much better than her. She thinks that, okay, I, I, I know I'm not working very well. I know I'm a little sad about the results, the outcomes I get, but I, I have nothing to contribute because I'm just a teacher. So then we spend a lot of years building trust. Remember trust, which is so crucial. But it's not just trust about me and you. It's mainly trust about you on yourself, on your capacity. You must you know that you have 50% of the knowledge to build a real solution. And that takes a long time. And we fail a lot. Oh, I, I'm spending, I, I, we can create just a panel about failing. Because in Brazil, this is another heavy word. So when you, in Brazil you fail, you think you are incompetent. You think, so failing is a crucial part. So I love failing because failing is a crucial part of innovation. I, I like to say, if you are developing a social innovation, a social technology, and you not fail, be very aware because probably you make a big mistake, you are not competent to look at it. So failing is important. And to understand failing, how to move forward, is so important as well. So when we start synapsing, we realize that there is no software system for schools in Sajip. So any public school in 2010 had a system to manage data. So how can you make innovation and follow, and follow the results if you have no data control? So then we create TAG. TAG is Tecnologia de Apoio a Gestão, is a management system to help schools to manage data, registration, notes, frequency, etc. 
Now, STAR is the only system recognized by the Ministry of Education in Brazil as a software for helping schools to manage data. It's free and it works online and offline because most of the schools in Santa Luzia are in rural areas, no internet connection. But we have a synchronization mechanism through, via pen drive, and this year we are going to synchronize through mobile app. So we developed time because it was required. So after five years, in 2004, we reached the first efficacy methodology just for the first grade, which was a booklet for the teachers. So this booklet was prepared, elaborated with all together. If you open the book, which is available on our website, you find all the teachers as co-authors. And we create a, a content for tablets and smartphones because the municipal doesn't have, doesn't have money to print these books for the old children. So this thing is becoming commodity step by step. So look, five years, only failing. So no government is going to finance this thing. Only private sector is capable to do that. The government has the mandatory, they have money, but they don't have competence or capacity to understand long-term perspective because they have an election in two years. For mayor or for governor, every two years we have an election in Brazil. So private sector, private investment, is the only hope we have in Brazil to finance innovation. So when you reach this level, so in 2010, we moved back to Sergipe in 2009. In 2010, the governor of Sergipe, they qualify a PTI as a social organization, a state social organization. In Brazil, that means we have a kind of PPP, public-private partnership with the state. We are completely independent politically. Financially, 85% of our budget comes from private sector or the net donors. So we have a complete freedom, which is very complicated with the government because the government does not want like to work with someone who is free. So we hack at the government, which is very nice. But anyway, because we are a social organization, we are invited from the state secretary of education to scale up the solution that we developed in Santa Luzia. So then we came to the poorest region in Sergipe, what we call Baixo São Francisco. So here we have the San Francisco River, and those, those 14 municipalities combined, they make the lowest human development index in an average in Sergipe. And then we came there, because this is, this is very important to point out, scalability is crucial but cannot be the first outcome. Most of the companies, they come to finance and they expect, okay, I want something scalable, but they want to have scalability as a first outcome. Scalability is a consequence of something very effective and competent. So, we, we, need, we needed, we spent six years until to reach a scalability, uh, scalability experience. But in the first moment, we start Synapse in 2010, we have to put efficacy and scalability and sustainability as a mind, so as a, as in, in, our, in mind. So you cannot let this thing to think later. You must think in the first moment, but it's a consequence, not the first outcome. So then we create a, a model where Kiara will now disappear. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> so we create a model that who came to the region on the north of Sergipe was Kiara to teach. There was no one better than her who helped us to build the solution to become the disseminator. First of all, it's cheaper. We pay less for her than for someone from the Federal University of Sergipe or something like that. Has much more empathy because she is, she is working in the same reality as the others. And we create a kind of goodwill wave. So the people that has done here well, become disseminated for the next year. We are going to start in the last weekend of this month, the third experience, so 2018, and we have 12 disseminators now. We start with four, all from Santa Luzia. Now we have three from Santa Luzia and nine from the region. So we can relocate scale in a geometric pro progression. Scalability, unfortunately, is not something you can do this jump. We have a very great experience in Brazil, in, in Sobral, in Ceará. I don't know if you heard about what Sobral is. It's a worldwide example of success in a long-term investment in change. Then Dilma government took the experience of Sobral and created PENAIC. Open It's a national program. Everything at the same time, 
is killing me. They spend huge of money, wasting money in terms of something that there is no effectiveness because there is not a scalability model prepared to. So we lost the chance and we lost hope for a very good example to make a disaster, financial in terms of effectiveness. So unfortunately, really believe you can change the world, okay, be part of the change, but it takes time. Sorry, it's real. <laughs> And that was only possible because two companies, two private companies, they finance this innovation. Oi Futuro, along the first five years, and Itaú Social for the next two years. So we have seven years of social, private social investment to create Synapse. Now Synapse is a public policy, and now we are building with the Internet Bank of Development, hopefully, we are building a social business to create a, something very disruptive to create a scalability for the whole nation in a sustainable, effective, and long-term perspective. So this, is, this was only possible because you have private investment, because no government would finance this. So a second case study is in education for entrepreneurship. So this is Mateus. Mateus is the typical person we really want to help. He has 13 brothers. Five, so four for the same mother, and until nine years old, he lived with the experience to see her mother, his mother, receiving aggression from the father almost every day. So at, when he, he was nine, the father left, and he, his mother took care of about five children family with 300 reais per month, because she fish crabs, aratu, which I suggest you want to visit me to taste aratu, is one of the most tasteful things in the world. <laughs> so, and he's very nice. He's a very nice guy. And he was discovered in 2012 by PTI because we opened a call. So when I talk about a call, it's a car driving all the villages with a loudspeaker. There is a call <laughs> uh, to select people that he likes, likes to draw. Because we had a previous project on craft and contemporary design where all designers are from Sao Paulo, Rio, etc. So we need to find designers in Santa Rosa Itaí. Okay, this is a utopi, but without utopi, it's better to make suicide. <laughs> because the real world is very boring. So it's <laughs> crucial to have utopi. <laughs> anyway, so we opened the call and Mateus was selected because he likes to draw. So we selected the best 20 people. And we gave for these people the best material, art material of the world. I mean, we're not talking about something scholar. We really gave the best material of the world. And we bring to him the best teacher we could find in Brazil for watercolor illustrations. He lives in a mangrove area. So we focus on mangrove because most of society thinks that mangrove is dirty and stink. Of course, it's our mangrove for our city because we did it. If you go to mangrove, it's the opposite, it's life. So then we focus on illustration, mangrove, looking maybe in the future to find designers. And Mateus, he received one class per month, a weekend, along 13 weekends. And after 13 weekends, 13 months, he achieved this quality of level. So this is a watercolor from Mateus. It's amazing. But there are two things here. Talent, he has a talent before. The best thing, the best opportunity we could offer mm -hmm. is not a school or opportunity, it's a real professional opportunity. And commitment. Along this period, we not just focus on training or preparing Mateus to be a good illustrator. <coughs> we also try to prepare him to be a good citizen. To understand ethics. Not ethics to be not corrupt because it's all obvious. But at, in terms of understanding that he is involved in a very poor region, he has a duty to become a social entrepreneur on his community. It's not about generosity, it's about competitiveness. It's about being capable to real build businesses in the future. So after that, so you see efficacy here. So then he became art teachers on these schools. When I talk about Matthews, I'm talking about a set of students, of course. And he started to teach art in the school of his village. So those are draws from the students from Mateus. So it's the same quality he can teach as he received the best teacher in Brazil. 
and we gave, so up to now, I think we, we have achieved more than 1,500 students. It's funny because the person who sponsored this project from the private company, probably he could not sleep for months. Because, oh my God, I put a lot of money in a project that is just benefiting 20 people. We finish with 10. Oh my God, it's better to give the money for each family. But now he can smile because we could achieve 1,500 students for free. And they start to open business. Okay, you have effectiveness. We have scalability. Now we need, a, we need about think about sustainability. So then, because we create a beautiful book about mangrove bilingual, Portuguese and English, that we also can download from our website, some companies from the fashion sector came to us to talk. But most of the companies, they came to talk with us just to buy some drawers and make a collection. Say, look, this guy is going to take the money, buy an iPhone, and continue to be poor. We need commitment, we need a partnership. And the only one who accepted this challenge was Morena Rosa. The whole fashion collection from March 2017 was drawn, was created in Santa Luzia, all inspired in the mangrove. This is a, a Bira's draw. Bira is the king of, of ink. And this is a dress. We did also Osclin. So if you look about Sao Paulo Fashion Week this year, the collection of Osclin was drawn by the guys. And let me see. We just they helped the guys to create the first company. It's called Casa do Cacete. I cannot translate it in Portuguese. But the person has, what is this village? It's very far away, Casa do Cacete. So it was born Casa do Cacete. But we can call CDC in New York, which is easier. I remember about a, I remember about a group of musicians who has a CSS which is only by females, or by the woman that puts in, and CSS, CSS is considered is sexy. So I love it. Uh, it Including the band, it's very nice. But they created Casa do Cacete Company, which has a website. They produce t-shirts in the beginning, but they start to produce more things. Like, for example, the State Bank, they created this stamp to create the the, f the end of the year gifts for the customers. I mean, <coughs> Banese, Osclin, and Morena Rosa, they did not came to the guys because of charity, of generosity. They, they came to us because of abuses of opportunities. <coughs> so people don't need charity. People need uh, dignity. People really need opportunity. But in issues that they do not know, this is important. So if you really want to help, we need to change our mindset, because somehow, when you talk about, okay, the people has a different mindset, we also have the same. We have also have a conservative thinking when you put your investment in terms of social transformation. So then, to finish, so this was only came possible because Ambev and later Oi Futuro has took the decision, very, maybe hard decision, to invest in this so innovative thing in the beginning. So, we are only successful because people like that has believed that maybe let's put a little bit part of my money to make something different. Okay. My last bullets to provoke you and hope you can think a little bit better when you go back. First of all, please, complex is not complicated. Complicated is, is not to think complex. If you want to solve complex problems, you really have to think about complexity. And it's very funny because sometimes I, I, I make calls, I, I write proposals for calls, and I see, oh, your, proposal, your solution is very complex. I say, of course, the problem is complex, <laughs> but I fail a lot. So failing is crucial, important. So please admire people that fail and are capable to explain you. So when you did synapse, so, I, Oi Futuro has financed us for five years. When, when you start Synapse, I used to go to Rio de Janeiro every four or five months to explain face to face people how was our fail, what was the learning we got, the knowledge we got from this fail, and how we think we are going, how, are, how is our hypothesis, how to overcome this situation. So, this is a very hard working, but it was so important to achieve these results we achieved. Long-term perspective, please don't think when you put your money in short-term perspective. We really need to dream in something that you can build in the future. And uh, sorry, 
We can destroy the world very fast, but we cannot build a new world very fast. It takes time, because we need to, to change mentality, has to change culture, and that takes a long time. And we, need, we, do not need, we do not need to waste it in hope. When you talk about teachers, the most problem of teachers is trust, is to trust again, to dream again for the new generation. Once I said, I, I, I listed a teacher from Santa Luzia say, my God, I teach since 25 years, and every year I see a lot of genius people from pedagogy, etc. A lot of people put a lot of money, and my life is always worse than the year before. <laughs> it is real. Brazil has money. Brazil has, comp has competence. But Brazil has not the capacity to think in the long term in a with focus. This is what we can do together. Innovation, please, don't need to talk about it. And systemic approach. <laughs> systemic is become, has become my enemy. When I, when you started to work in, in Sergip with this systemic approach between education, health for education, and business through creative economy, okay, we are we, we start to put the word systemic because you know people love systemic. They think systemic is crucial. But then people realize that few people really understand how is it, what's, what means systemic. And even less people know how to do it. I remember I was in a big bank in Brazil, make a presentation, and a lady, a director, she said, oh, what you do is beautiful, but you have no focus. I said, look, you have a narrow mind. This is your problem. <laughs> because this is the problem. Because if you if the children has anemia in school, he is we have is going to have much more less diff, much more difficult to to learn. If he doesn't learn very well, he's going to have a more difficult to get a, a good job, a good work. If he doesn't have the good money enough, he cannot buy the good food. So this is a systemic approach. But anyway, this is very complicated. It's become my enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet, so I'd like to finalize with two things, two references that I really recommend to you. The first one is a TED talk from Dan Palota. I like to say that I cry all the time when I see this presentation because this is a, a perfect speech how social investment has to change if you want to really to achieve global issues. And the second one is a book from Bernard Shaw called Socialist for Millionaire. I love this title. It's in 1901. But he has a sentence. The book I really recommend is a very funny but also inspiring book. But he has a sentence that he says, never give people something they want. Give them something they should want, but they do not want. <laughs> because this is innovation. And Gilberto Gil has a similar phrase. He say, people want they know what they want, but they also want what they do not know. <laughs> and this is the way we really need to focus. This is our mantra. When we really want to help people to change their world and to change their lives in the way you really believe. So if you want to, to make good, let's think different. So thank you very much. I want to... I want to pick up on the last point that Salo made about George Bernard Shaw and Gilberto Gil. Because when Steve Jobs first created the iPod, he went to various retailers and corporations and said, look what I've created. And they said, no one wants that. <laughs> he had the same experience with the iPhone. People just want a faster phone connected to their wall or their desk. What are they going to do with this thing? So it's that thinking outside of the realm of experience that really matters. And that's what I think IPTI has done. And the reason it's become a model for so many other uh, organizations, trying not just to change lives, but to change outcomes for those lives. So why am I here? I'm a business guy. I have worked in Brazil for 15 years on and off. And as many of you know better than I, when you start working in Brazil, suddenly you find, much to your surprise, that you're part of a very large, rambunctious, loving family that you didn't realize you were a part of. And I was introduced to Salo by friends. and. 
because of both my personal experience and my professional experience, I was impressed not just by his vision and his beliefs, but by his approach. And I won't use the word systemic, I will use the word holistic. As he indicated in his presentation, his approach is not just to give people skills. Do you want to hit that slide? This uh, slide was produced by the World Economic Forum. And what it shows is, uh, on the basis of their research, the top 10 skills that people will need in the future. Now, there are a number of interesting things about that. But to me, the most interesting is that despite all we've heard about what the acronym in the US is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, do you see any of those on there? No. And for two reasons, which I believe are inherent in the approach that Salo and other innovative organizations will take. One reason is, quite frankly, because a lot of the science, technology, engineering, and math is going to be done by computers. We call it roboticization, but it's really computers and algorithms and the software that run them. So many of the entry level jobs that people are being taught to do with basic technology are going to disappear in the next 10 years because they're going to be replaced by even more advanced technology, artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural nets, and so forth. So are we helping people by teaching those skills? Well, yes, at some very basic level we are because uh, today when people talk about technology businesses, you have to laugh because what business is not the technology business today? Who does not have all their data uh, on servers? Who is not mining that data for insights about their customers? Who is not using that data to generate new solutions to help uh, not just sustain, but promote the future of those organizations? So yes, to, to use an analogy, that's the ante to get you into the card game. It is not sufficient to help you survive in the future. So when you look at these skills, what you see is really creativity and innovation. It's critical thinking. It's being able to interact with others. Emotional intelligence. How do you work in a group because there's no more Marlboro Man anymore. It's people working in teams to produce solutions. And even in Silicon Valley, you may have noticed that you know, there have been, over the last 10 years, a number of lawsuits where Samsung and Apple are suing each other and Google and Uber are suing each other because of, quote unquote, the ownership of intellectual property. Most of these suits are being dismissed or they're being dropped. And why is that? Because what we're discovering is that through human evolution, just as through human evolution, you can't identify the original source of any of this knowledge or information. It's, you know, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Everybody is learning from everyone else, especially as technology and information become more widespread and more instantaneous. So, again, service orientation, negotiation, cognitive flexibility. Now, the interesting thing about this is, I just found this slide two days ago just sent it to Salo yesterday. So in creating IPTI and his philosophy for delivering social technology, he had no knowledge of this. But inherent in his approach is the ability to imbue his partners in the community, his partners in business uh, and in government <coughs> with these kinds of skills in order to help them achieve the outcomes that are necessary. 
And again, the, to me, the brilliance of this approach is that people who come from sometimes devastating social <coughs> situations, who are cut off from the rest of the world in many ways, that those of us who live in New York or London or Beijing or other large cities can't imagine, are now able to connect to that world, not just to look at Facebook or to watch videos, but to contribute and to monetize their experience in ways that weren't capable, that weren't possible 10 years ago. So what this suggests to me is that when Salo talks about education, it's not just teaching people to code or teaching people how to translate their illustrations into uh, ways of selling online. It's how to be a better citizen, how to contribute to your economy, because in Brazil, I would argue perhaps more than many of us would like to admit, in the US, we can't rely on government the way we have for the last, at least the last 50 years and possibly the last 100 years. People have to, by necessity, take their futures in their own hands. And so, IPTI, this approach of treating the people with whom you are working, not as beneficiaries, not as objects of charity, but as partners from whom the organization and the funders will learn as much as they will learn from those making the opportunity possible. I think it is this circularity, if you will, this sense of community that is going to be crucial to the way of succeeding because the traditional notion of okay the you know the, we call it bolsa uh, I forget what the familia, familia. Uh, in the U.S. we've had various programs food stamps and and others the pressure and I think it is relentless the pr pressure is to reduce the size and the impact of those programs. So what do people do? It's not like poverty is going away. It's not like mental health is going away. It's not like family problems are going away. Those all still exist. The people who they impact still exist. As a society, we have an obligation and a self-interest, frankly, to do something about it. As businesses, these are our customers, these are our future customers, particularly in a global socioeconomic system where people in New York can buy t-shirts from Brazil and expect them to be delivered within two days. Um, so it is in our interest to, folk, to think about what this means. How do you, not just how do you give people skills, but how do you make this possible? How do you inculcate this way of thinking? And it is revolutionary, but the, from a business standpoint, the, my belief is that the companies contributing to IPTI and other organizations like it are going to learn as much as they, they're going to receive probably more than they give because the success of this type of organization will be crucial to economic success in the future. So for me, it's been a, a, a thrill to be part of IPTI and really just to watch what Salo and his colleagues are doing. <coughs> but I think the future for all of us depends on this kind of success and the question I would pose to you this morning is, so how do you translate this from Sergipe, from one of the arguably 10 poorest villages in the entire country of Brazil, 
to major corporations in New York or Miami or San Francisco or elsewhere because these aren't just skills that matter in Sergipe or Brazil. They're skills that matter for Apple and Google and Facebook and everybody else who benefits from them. So I we'll look forward to hearing your thoughts about what Salvo has presented this morning. Thank you. Uh, John Cohane, thank you very much. Um, I mean, there's so many questions I could only. So I live in Sergipe. You can come and visit me. Would you ever? <laughs> I've never been to Sergipe. I've always been curious because it's always that kind of that state that nobody ever talks about. <laughs> yeah. you know? And uh, I lived nine years in Brazil, so I know the country quite well and the culture, and I really relate to what you're talking about. And I. Bernard Shaw's quote is spot on. Um, I have a mother-in-law who lives in a nice um, building in Rio, and the people that built the buildings around her um, created a, a, an enclosed favela. And, it cre and it's really a, a favela that's not like the ones that are in uh, São Conrado. And, it's, and instead of doing something about it, um, the people that have their terrace, they create a way to block it, right? And my idea as an American was like, hey, you only need a few cans of paint, you know, because it's like it's almost finished. It's not quite there yet. But it's, do the people want it, you know? Because do the Brazilians want to spend their money to actually, they're okay, maybe the esteem or something, it's hard to convince the people that it's worth painting their house and making it finished than to, I don't know, spend the money somewhere else. And so it's, a, it's complex and it requires a different way of thinking and not realizing what they want. So that quote to me makes so much sense. You have to project this into the, into the world and, because they don't know what they want. So if they end up having a house that's painted eventually, they might just want to paint it again in five years to keep it nice. They might. You know, maybe they won't, but they don't even know it right now. So um, I think the prototype that you illustrated there was like it was so emotional to just see those colors. You know, what what from because I had the vision of being you know being in the street and making an announcement to 1,500 people um, involved in in this creative project. So I was wondering, well, what else you got to do in a village? You got to build it. So you have to have the the engineers, you have to have the the masons. You have. Are you? Is this prototype something that has expanded into other areas of, you know, of um, you know, sanitary, having sanitary, having uh, those systems? I, um, where are you in that? Because you you talk about it being uh, the most creative in the world by 2025. Um, I think that's a great example of what you've done creatively with the artists. Um, where is it? Where is your vision going forward in terms of making, you I mean, I know poor sections and all over, you can go anywhere, you can get out of the airport in Rio and all, I can't, I, you don't have to go to Sergipe to understand poverty. I've been in homes that are dirt floors and, you know, it's just, you know, it's Brazil. Um, so my question is how do we, you know, how do you transform Brazil to, to have, you know, tile floors kind of thing? That's a good question. Uh, we have a vision about that. Uh -huh. uh, we are currently in 32 cities in five different states. Mm. I mean, everything starts from Santa Luzia. Why? Because Santa Luzia has the worst conditions. But they have capacities like I saw Chiara and Mateus and many others. If we build solutions into the around this context, we can scale for any person. If you work in Santa Luzia, you can work in any city in Brazil, but also in Latin America and Africa. So currently, as we have seven social technologies in different areas, always education, health, and creative economy, in the scalability phase, and we have new eight social technologies being developed, everything through this holistic model. But when it reaches an uh, efficacy level, and our, our scalability model is ready, we go to other cities and we try to help. But our vision is we have a strategic planning, 
that he tell us that in 2022 we are going to launch a Master of Arts in Social Technology in Santa Luzia, mm. international. We, in the order we can help other communities to do similar, we need to have competent and skilled people in terms of management of innovation in those cities. So we hope that people from countries in Latin America, countries in Africa can come to Santa Luzia, stay with us, learn how to do, and come back to their original cities to help us to build this kind of international network of social technology institutions. This is our vision. You know, this is what we believe. And there is no country in the world that can do that better than Brazil. We have a horrible low self-esteem to think in Brazil that the rest of the world is much better than us. Mm. I travel all around the world. I like to go to places where no tourist likes to go. Like I, I, I made a vacation in Iran three years ago, which I really recommend. Uh, it's, a, it's a problem in my passport now to have a stamp from Iran to a rich in the US, but it's okay. <laughs> but when I arrived in Iran, the, the guy in the, in the immigration center, when he looked at that I was Brazilian, so he's mine. I mean, everyone wants to be Brazilian. Mm. And we show to the world a stereotype profile what it means to be Brazilian. In fact, we are a great country. Our people are the, our, our biggest um, economic asset. And you, we waste money, economic opportunities, and hope along the time. So for me, Brazil is the most crucial country in the world to produce social technology. Why? because we have money, we have competencies, and we have problems. And we are some business, we play some. <laughs> so when an American or a German or a, a British arrive in Mozambique, he arrived as an imperialist. Sorry to say that, that's true. Mm. If Brazil arrives there, we are some business. So we have empathy that no country has. Mm. But you cannot, we, we do not learn how to use it in an economic and effective way. So this is our vision. Please join us. Yes. Hi, I'm Stella Dallari. I work as a consulate here in New York, the Brazilian consulate, but in the commercial office. And I'm interested in knowing more how you bridge the illustrator to Morena Rosa, the illustrator to Ostlin. How do you how do you do that? because most people don't know how to bring those two sides together. And they go one way, the other one goes the other way, and nobody wins. So, so we build networks. Since to, so when we started IPTI in Santa Luzia, I started to create a list of email <laughs> of good news. In the beginning I have 15 people, now I have about 1,000 people, maybe I can include yours. So I share only good news. And through this network, and we know a lot of people, so I, we travel a lot to show what we do. We, in, in fact, Morena Rosa has found us. A guy who was connected with Morena Rosa, and we saw our draws, the book, and he said, oh, this is a good opportunity. But before, Havaianas has talked talk with us, and Cantão is another brand, fashion brand from Rio de Janeiro, has also talked with us through the, our network. So building network is crucial. How can you can disseminate? But to be, to be effective, you must surprise your network. When you saw the draws for, for Mateus, you are surprised. So how a poor guy from this city can make a draw like that? Patricia has mentioned about the project in program coding that Brazil Foundation supported. So this year, you are all invited to come to our event in October. We are bringing a girl, 16 years old girl, who is making robotics. He is making a low-cost ro robot, robot uh -huh. to help children to learn maths and language in the primary schools connected to with synapse. I mean, it's surprising to see a girl, 16 years old, from a very poor village, producing coding, producing software for companies. For me, it's not surprising. They are there. Creativity, competence, and capacity to dream belongs to all children and adolescents. What we do, we kill through the schools, the, the traditional schools, or through our incapacity to bring hope. What we are doing, we are doing absolutely not. We are just, just creating paths. And the world is ready and anxious to connect with these things. So the guy from Morena Rosa, he did something great, because to be honest, the most of companies, they really want to buy just the draws. 
But as I said, so the guy received the money, and okay, he buy an iPhone and become continue poor. So because it's much harder for a company to come and stay with us eight months, that was one of the house has done, to build capacities there in terms of becoming entrepreneur in fashion, because it brings a lot of cost and a lot of risk also, because then you have somehow attach your brand during a period with this social project. But the president of the company has sent all his staff, I mean 12 people, came to Santa Luzia to remain a few days together with the people. So this is a kind of thing that really uh, changed people. So the, the kids really change after that. So that's the way you do uh, networking. It makes surprising thing because I I hate to see people giving poor things for poor people. Sometimes this is a project very very paradigmatic for us because some friends of mine who are who are wealthy in the Sajid context. Sometimes I heard, but look, you are giving the best material of the world for this guy. Why? They are poor. We do not, this is a waste of money. I said, no, your son doesn't need that because this guy has enough disadvantage. If you are really want to change, do not give a pet, uh, a half a pet. What's that? Plastic bottle. Plastic bottle. Okay, do not give poor things. We give the best because they have enough disadvantage. So surprise and network is crucial how we connect. The rest comes very easy. One other question, if I may. Uh, your model, how do you compare your model to the model of the United Nations Global Compact? I, I cannot do that. I only know that uh, a, a lady came to work with me two years ago. She, she's a daughter of a friend. And she came to me because she she became a lawyer, but she didn't like the, the job, the work, so she decided to work with social things. And she was dreaming to work with, with United Nations. And she came to talk with me and said, Luciana, look, you must understand that United Nations is decreasing. IPTI is growing, so it's your decision. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, no, I just, I'm interested in the connection because you started by saying that you got tired of the university and nothing gets done, but you then finished your talk about the master's program. But can you expand on that, please? On the, and on the college, university, higher education level, and your project. So, a master is, is a, like an MBA, no? so it's a so a professional master. We are talking with some institutions abroad, so we're not, we, it's, I think it's important for us to have something more conservative in terms of a title that the guys can have in order to advertise and make more visible this thing. I have a dream to create a... I'm sorry, but isn't this a bit contradictory in terms mm. of... Somehow... Why not at Brazilian University if you have the capacity there? and you need to sort of like get an international degree? I'm, I'm just... No, I'm not going to declare it. When I start to discuss with the federal government about this master, they all the time they suggest me to make a partnership with a federal university. Because it's easier. The government can send the money very easily, etc. But I quit the, the Brazilian university because I disagree with the model they do in terms of producing innovation. So I don't agree with the international institutions, but at least the, the dean of the institution is far away from me when we have discussions. I mean, I think have a, a kind of MEA or MBA, something like that, is important for the people that are coming and stay with us one year. But the recognition can be for any institution. We are not going to build our own institution. We, we, we really want to remain small in terms of team because we work very well in a network. I work very well with several universities in Brazil because they, don't, they do not have all these skills. For example, now we are developing a low, a, a, a low cost device to analyze hemoglobin for the anemia, the iron deficiency anemia. We have a, a equipment, but this is already, the technology is already uh, old. And we have to work with people from the University of Sao Paulo who also is connected with people from Harvard. So I, we work in a network. But in terms of, of the NEA, I don't think it's contradictory. But I understand your, I understand your point. Uh, so, Mario Suez from Business Travel Juice, congratulations, very inspiring. 
Uh, what was the positive side effect for Synapse, for instance, with the basics? You know, because uh, someone can get the best of a, a tool to educate, mm -hmm. but they still come into a school without food or perhaps without the basics, you know, and experience to live in, in Angola for 18 months where people cannot go to the school, children, without a chair. Because if they don't have a chair, they cannot uh, assist class. So it was engaged in projects to give chairs. That's usually what companies do, try to fix the basic that the public cannot do. But what was the positive side effect after you, in those 30 uh, cities, that all those bases led by public uh, or government or even though for other uh, institutions, by providing food for people that come to school because they can have a great technology, but if without, you know, have the merenda, no, or if, yeah. Is there something that you can share with us? Yes. Yeah. So, the focus on, on the reapplication experience that I show in the last, in fact, we did last year because 2016 was a major, major election. So, it was a very bad year to work. But yes, last year was great. And the focus of Synapse is teachers. So, we prepare teachers to give a better class. Mm -hmm. So, we are going to measure the impact on the students next year. Mm -hmm. Why? Because this takes a long time. So let's say you finish with 338 teachers involved in this technology, understanding. Synapse is very strongly based on planning. Mm -hmm. And teachers do not learn how to plan. Usually they, they, they do what they think. And contextualize, which is very crucial for kids to understand. So these are seems to be obvious, but it's not working in the public schools. So we finished the work last year with people, with teachers involved. Of course, this year we accept back they are going to give better classrooms. We put technology tablets in all schools because the, the state government has put the money. But along this, all this year, we also, through Synapse, we start to understand the issues that affect negative the learning. You mentioned about food. We, we offer for the government four new social technologies to be developed. Okay, we developed the tag, the software to manage data because you have to plan, you must yeah. to have evidence to plan. But we also said we need to improve the relation between families and education. Not because we think, because we observe from the relation. We need to improve quality in management in schools. We are not talk about software, we are talking about management process. We need to create something for the child education. I mean, the period between three and six years old, because before the children go to the schools. Why? Because the teacher from the first grade, you receive a completely heterogeneous people coming from very poor and destroyed families with a lot of problems in terms of sociability, uh, impulse control, etc. And the first one, which for me is the most crucial issue in Brazil, is early childhood. That we start from the pregnancy period. I mean, we make a survey in 2010. And we found 28 20% of the children in schools with some kind of cognitive disability. It's three times more than any part of the world. And we interview all the mothers. 68% reported undesired pregnancy. 55% desired, uh, reported some kind of stress with the man, with the husband. So then we have alcohol, etc. So the, the science has proven that a pregnancy with a stress can amplify the possibility of the children to develop a kind of cognitive disability. <coughs> so, Brazil needs to do, take a look about this process. So, adolescents avoid becoming pregnant when they are not ready to. Pregnancy period to be as less stressful as possible. And the children, when they are born, until the children reach the child education, has to be very careful taking. What we see in Brazil is much more assist, assistance programs rather than a, develop, a human development program. So those topics also is a learning from this process of creating synapse. Of course, we, are, we have now the, the money, the budget to develop the two news, the relation between the families and education, and then improve management. The other two, we are searching for grants, but it's part of the process. But in terms of outcomes, Brazil makes evaluation each two years. It's called Provinha Brasil. It's, uh, on, it's in 2017 was the last one. 2019 will be the next one. That's the year we expect to have real results in terms of student outcomes. You've raised uh, a point, though, that I think is really important because it's tied to the 
the way the economy is developing, which is that investing in chairs or in blackboards, uh, intangible items is becoming less important than the growth in software and providing tablets or providing learning because it's those intangibles that are now driving more revenue than the tangibles are. Uh, the value of, you know, the number of, the, the weight of the economy, the World Economic Forum has uh, analyzed, is actually considerably less than it was 100 years ago because we're not producing as many things, as much stuff. We're producing ideas and concepts and results, and that's what's creating the outcomes that we want, which is why I think this approach is so important and so valuable. Okay, my question would be uh, fundamentally when we're talking about uh, the type of education that uh, was raised when I was in Brazil, there were a lot of uh, full-time schooling <coughs> in which you come something around the 7 o'clock in the morning and you leave at 4 o'clock. Okay, so what is the intensity when you do, of course, you're thinking there is no way that you can educate individuals, particularly children, okay, without long-term okay, perspective. So what type of intensity, what kind of uh, environment you create Why? the children is there for you to create this kind of, uh, you know, commitment to long-term results. So that's something that I also, and I see that the, one of the most important points that you have made in the presentation, outstanding presentation, which is that you are not trying to change, okay, the individual's environment. And uh, when you do this, okay, uh, of course, you try to make sure that it changes from within out. It seems that that's a way understood, but, uh, you know, correct if I'm wrong, but uh, this is something that I would like to see what uh, is your thoughts. Brazil has changed a lot in terms of in integral education. Now we have a huge program, a national program to give back the schools the chance to have integral uh, so the daily activities. In our case, we work with the municipal schools. They have no space, so usually they have a school that has a, on the morning the, what we call the fundamental one, in the afternoon fundamental two. They have no space to have integral. They have no food. I mean, the merenda is very, small. We have a nice program in Brazil to, to buy food from the local small farmers, but it's not, it's, there is no money enough for that. Uh, Brazil, all the cities are now in a financial crisis. So what we do, everything we do, we do extra class. Our dream, but we are not capable to do that up to now, is that all the municipal schools in Santa Luzia could create an integral uh, program to have traditional subjects in one period, and creativity in another period, they completely connect with the content they are learning in the morning. But this is still a dream, because there is absolutely no money and no capacity to do that. What we do, we offer the classes of, about illustration, coding, music, etc., uh, in counter, counter period. But Brazil has changed that sense, at least for the, for the secondary course, most of the, the schools now are becoming cha are changing to become integral period. But unfortunately, we cannot do that yet. Hope. Please. Hi there. My name is Rogério. Thank you for the inspiring presentation. Uh, you talking about funding. You, you said, well, uh, uh, the, the private sector is essential, is the only way to fund uh, these long term initiatives and so on. Uh, what's, what's your experience with the uh, donation from people, from uh, wealth people, or even crowdfunding, or this type of uh, thing? Because I know it's not the, the culture in Brazil mm -hmm. to donate for this type of initiatives, but uh, have you had any positive or, or your negative uh, experience on that? Because you said it, the only alternative for Brazil is the private sector, so that, that's true. Thank you. 
I would say not negative, but not the expect we had, but we learned a lot. And we are going to launch, still this year, a new program, how to raise money for donors in, in Brazil. But we, we start to open, in, in New York in 2016, an initiative to get with Brazil Foundation. We have now, we had our first real annual event last October, and we are going to have, so we are installing step by step, uh, we are formally being installed in, in US, I hope this end of this year. And because you know that culture here is much more keen about donating. And we have also the financial, uh, how can I say? In Brazil, we do have tax exempt for, don for donors. All, only if you put money in fundus, like Funda Infancia or one day, but not directly to the organization. So we open. It's very funny because we have a, our main headquarters in Santa Luzia Itaí and a filial in New York. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a city that is growing. We must have a good chance for New York. But it's very funny. So I, I advertise that very, very a lot. But we are open here. But New York initiative that Lara, Sonia are taking care of very carefully, and John, Ricardo, and many others are, are part of this initiative, has two main goals. One is to raise funds to cover our expenses and projects, which are, which are decided to be crucial. But the most important thing for me, in terms of vision, is we think New York can be a hub to coordinate articulation for South-South cooperation. I mean, if IPTI wants to bring solutions to Ghana, or Ecuador or Guatemala, why not to have an office in New York, in US, working to establish this relationship with companies or USAID or PATF or IDB. This is our dream. So we are raising funds here. We are going to start again a new program to raise funds from donors, but we are still learn about that. New York is going well. You are joined, you are invited to join this year. <laughs> but we, we are doing very well. In Brazil we do not have the culture and we are trying to learn and to do something better. We are going to launch this year a new initiative, but it's not our culture. But when I talk about private sector, it's not, it's not the only one who can make innovation. But the, in Brazil now, it's the only one who can push innovation. Because the government has a lot of money, they, they need to do that. But look about the Ministry of Science and Technology. What they are doing, they are just losing money. And they are financed, look, our academic system, our science and technology system is completely focused on promoting the individual career. You have money to, if you publish paper, if you go to conferences. So you, you, we do not finance technology. So and we are not going to change that in a short term because the people who decide, they are academics. So we have, a, they are completely closed and captured by this model that is a completely that model for me. So then I think private sector has the role and the opportunity to make things different and show the others that will be very nice. And to be honest, uh, when I call people from universities like Federal University of Sergipe or University of Sao Paulo to join our work, the teachers, the researchers, they became very happy. I mean, because in their own universities they have less capacity to do their things. Because it's very good to make good. But sometimes you can't, because your system doesn't allow, because you have so many pressure to publish so many papers, to uh, advise so many students. You are completely locked in this failed model, in my perspective. That's why I think, uh, Brazil is still a country of commodities and not a country of science and technology. So, I think it's time to... Thank you a lot for your patience and time. So we are very glad to be here and share this dream and this and provoke you somehow to become your apostles, how we translate apostles. So, so we are not going to open a church, don't be worried about that. But I think we, we need to disseminate the message to change the world. Thank you very much.